Hello, everybody, and welcome to the uh, May 12th edition of Therapy Thursday. Uh, <clears throat> welcome you all, uh, and thank you for spending some of your lunch hour with us if you're watching this live. Um, our Therapy Thursdays are brought to you by the Community Engagement Committee at UNC Health, uh, UNC um, Rehabilitation Services. Uh, we are uh, a division here that uh, we strive to bring information out to the community and really help to um, reach out um, and inform the community about uh, PT-related uh, topics and, and help the best that we can. Um, so today, our topic is going to be um, what I've entitled Twist and Shout, uh, Common Running Related Knee Injuries. Um, while, I'm, while I'm giving the presentation here, I invite you to kind of take a look at the chat box. I've already put in a couple of pieces of information in there um, about our links for our Facebook page, for one. Uh, I invite you to go on there and like our page and you'll find out about more um, uh, events and uh, upcoming Therapy Thursday talks. And there's also a link there for our YouTube channel. So if you have to jump out early today, or if you're interested in any variety of our topics, you can go to our YouTube page. Um, you can subscribe there and uh, take a look through our library of talks. And they're all there um, saved in posterity. So uh, view them at your, at your leisure. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get down to what, we, what we're going to be talking about today. So... Uh, twist and shout, common running related knee injuries. Oh, last thing about the chat, if you have any questions during the, during the uh, presentation today, please feel free to drop them in the chat. I will try to monitor it as best that I can. And if, um, uh, if I can answer it during, I will. And if not, uh, oh, we got some chats up. Okay, I'm gonna, if you have your chat open, I'm gonna put this back in here again. And maybe you can see it now that you've all just signed in. Should be there now. Uh, if you have any questions, you can drop them in um, while, while I'm talking. If I can answer it during then, I will. If not, I'll try to answer everything at the end. Okay, so here we go. So a little bit about my a little bit about me first. My name is Evan Adler. I'm a physical therapist. I'm the clinic coordinator. I'm a board certified orthopedic specialist. I'm based here at the uh, UNC Wellness Center at Northwest Cary, uh, which is very very close to uh, where I live in Durham, North Carolina. For those of you who are not local, watching this. Uh, I have some advanced certifications uh, in orthopedics. I'm certified for Grassen Technique, uh, which is in the form of instrument-assisted soft tissue mobilization and also dry needling, a uh, form of trigger point release. And uh, I think I have some talks on that on our YouTube channel as well. Uh, originally from New York, but I've been in North Carolina since 2008. Um, we've planted some roots. You can see their pictures right there. Um, those are my boys. Uh, and yeah, I'm, uh, I, before I was, uh, before I got uh, hurt recently, I was an avid runner. Uh, I enjoy play, I enjoy running, playing tennis, uh, playing softball and cycling, uh, and spending time with my family. So, um, that's a bit about me. Today, we're going to talk about knee injuries. So we're going to describe the overall running gait mechanics in terms of uh, efficiency, explain the importance of the kinetic chain, we're going to talk about the knee anatomy, and then we're going to talk about the most common running injuries and some strategies to, uh, to prevent them. Um, let's see, i got to move some things around my screen here. Okay, here we go. All right, so let's talk about running injuries. Um, 60 to 80 percent of runners experience some level of injury every year. If I were doing this in person, I would say raise your hand if you have have an injury this year. I know my hand goes way up. Uh, most of these injuries are musculoskeletal overuse injuries due to this cumulative overload of the lower extremities, right? So pounding, pounding, pounding while you're running, uh, step after step over and over and over again. That's how we get most of our injuries. So I know that um, you know, seven, and 70 to 80% of these injuries occur from the waist down. 
it makes sense, right? We're, we're connecting with the ground, we're hitting the ground. Um, that shock is going up the chain. Um, you're gonna have more of those injuries below the waist than above. Now, um, when we look at the kinetic chain, which we'll talk about soon, we can extra extrapolate that most non-traumatic non injuries, so these overuse injuries, are a result of a muscle imbalance with or without improper compensation. Now, I entitled this, this talk Twist and Shout, but I, I, that's kind of erroneous because we're not going to focus too much on these um, traumatic injuries where you step funny, you twist, and something kind of snaps on you, right? We, today, we're going to focus on more of these common injuries, which are more of these overuse type injuries. So let's talk about that kinetic chain. Uh, I love using this quote uh, for this, you know, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, right? When we run, even that single step, uh, you got to start somewhere and um, it can lead to great injury if we're not utilizing our chain properly because with every mile, you're taking a thousand steps per foot. <clears throat> that's a lot of steps. That's a lot of stress. That's a lot of pressure going through that chain. So what I always look for um, with this kind of chain of, of dynamic movement is do people have the right balance of stability and mobility? Okay, so in the body, I, I always think about it as, as every other joint, every other joint, stable, mobile, stable, mobile, stable, mobile, right? And that's what kind of keeps us, keeps us moving, but with enough strength and power um, to be effective and efficient. So if we look from the bottom up, the foot itself, even though it has, oh, I don't know, umpteen million bones in it, uh, the foot is, has a, so many different, different uh, planes of, of movement with all the different joints. What's most important is that it, it has to be a stable joint so that it acts as a rigid lever. It flexes and helps to push off. Okay? Above the foot, you have your ankle, which needs to be a more mobile joint, right? So it doesn't just move straight up and down. It has this kind of in and out movement. It has to adjust to different terrain. So you have to have that mobility at the ankle. Um, the knee, which we're gonna talk about today, should be a stable joint. It is a hinge joint. It's nothing, it's, um, you know, I, I, I always like to say it's just a simple, stable joint. Okay, so it shouldn't be as complicated as these other uh, mobile joints, like the hip, a ball and socket joint. You have a lot of movement there that you need to control. Your lumbar spine needs to be stable, that core strength. Keep that lumbar spine, your low back nice and steady. And then your thoracic spine, right, where your ribs attach, that's where you need to have a little bit more rotational mobility. But today we're focusing on that knee, which is a simple joint. Let's talk about the anatomy of the, of the knee real quick, okay? So first you have your tibiofemoral joint, right? So your tibia, or commonly known as your shin bone, on the bottom, and then your, uh, and then your femur, which is the largest, longest bone in the body, right? That's your thigh bone, right? And where those two come down together and they, they hit, that's your tibiofemoral joint. That's what we think of as our knee. It's a simple joint. It's a hinge, just kind of opens up. It's a little more complicated than that, right? So it has a little bend and a little bit of glide to it, but in essence, it's just a simple hinge. Things get a little more complicated when we add the kneecap into it or your patella. Then you get your patella femoral joint. So that's where your kneecap is gliding up and down in the groove on your femur. So it should be tracking and going, I have NS there, so just north-south. Right, so going up and down as needed, and it creates a literal mechanical advantage like a pulley system. Okay, so you think about pulling up and down on a, on a, on a pulley, it gives you more force to, to, um, to lift something. Same thing with the knee. You have that pulley in place so that when you extend your knee, you have the mechanical advantage of your patella, your kneecap, to help extend your knee out there. Okay, so let's talk about the muscles and the tendons real quick. Now, this is not going to be a super crazy in-depth talk today. We don't have time for all of that, so we're going to focus on a few things. Um, <clears throat> here, we're going to primarily look at your quads 
and your hamstrings, okay? So your quads are on the front of your thigh. They run from high up either on the femur or on the pelvis, and they're gonna run down the front of the thigh, kind of go into some connective tissue around your kneecap, and then attach down onto the front of your tibia or your shin bone, pretty high up. Um, you can feel a little protuberance, a little bit of um, uh, bone sticking out uh, at the top of your shin. That's where your, 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 um, your quads will attach. On the back side, you have your hamstrings, right? So they're responsible. They run all the way up from kind of that sit bone, right? So if you're sitting on hard bleachers, um, you wiggle around, you can feel your butt bone there, right? That's where your hamstrings start. They run down the back side of your thigh and attach um, behind the knee or just past onto the, onto, the, um, onto the lower leg. And those are responsible for actively contracting and bending your knee while your quads are doing uh, the opposite to actively extend your knee. The tendons I wanna focus on here are just your quad tendon and your patellar tendon. So the quad tendon is where your quads kind of come together and they form the tendon that um, gets attached to your kneecap above the kneecap. And then after your kneecap, you have your patellar tendon, which then continues down and attaches to your shin bone, All right? So with a lot of overuse, those can get irritated. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. All right, ligaments and meniscus, or menisci. So, um, so with your, men, with your, with the ligaments, um, let's talk about kind of the easy ones first, right? So you have your, uh, medial and lateral collateral ligaments, and they kind of act as kind of struts on both sides. They kind of keep, keep the, um, the, the, the femur and the tibia, it kind of attaches them on the side, kind of forms brackets around the joints. Um, so, uh, kind of just attaching bone to bone. Then you have your ACL and your PCL, or your anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments. They crisscross their way through the middle of the joint to prevent translation. So um, if you think about your tibia uh, as it moves on your femur, uh, your ACL is going to prevent the tibia from sliding forward, where the PCL prevents it from sliding backwards. Um, your meniscus, um, so you, you have two, right? So you have a C-shaped meniscus on the medial or the inside and, a, and an O-shaped uh, meniscus on the lateral, the outside. Those come together and this cartilaginous ring will form a little bit, not just of a spacer and protector between the two parts of the knee, the, of the femur and the tibia, but also creates a deeper cup for when the, um, when the femur comes down into the joint, that it's not just a flat surface on a flat surface, that you have these, um, these kind of cups there so it, so it can glide a little bit more, uh, a little bit easier movement. One thing I like to add in here is we talk about the unhappy triad, um, which, is a, which is usually a traumatic in, incident where it's a tear of your ACL, your MCL, and your medial meniscus. Um, you hear about that a lot in um, contact sports, uh, a lot in football, a lot in, in soccer. Um, and, uh, well, basically it's not a great injury to have. All right, but let's talk about the more common knee injuries and what I want to focus on here today. So <clears throat> the first one I want to talk about is patellofemoral pain syndrome, PFPS. Now, um, this is, we see this in running a whole lot, okay? It's a pain that is located directly under or deep to the kneecap, okay? There's not a whole lot of pain at rest with this um, because it usually involves this maltracking of the patella, right? So as the kneecap is, is moving up and down on the femur as you're moving your, your knee, um, you can get that patella doesn't move just north-south. It can kind of twist a little bit or it'll pull off to the side a little. And that grinding, um, whether it be from tightness or overactivity of the quads or pulling from one direction or the other, you're going to get that, that pain, especially when you go into a bent or flexed knee. 
especially if you're under pressure, like with running or squats or stairs. Now, it's not as bad when you're at rest because you're not moving. You may have some lingering pain, but it's not, um, uh, it's not as, as intense. It's more of that kind of dull, achy, um, something hurts or something did hurt and it's going to hurt again. Uh, whereas when you're running or doing stairs, it's going to be more of that sharp kind of grindy type pain. Okay, so um, one of the other ones that we see that's very common is quad or patellar tendonitis. So this is pain that's going to be located uh, in one of those tendons, right? So above or below the kneecap, uh, proximal or distal, uh, quad tendon above, patellar tendon below. Um, there may be that residual pain at rest after activity, right? Because that tendon is inflamed. It may have that kind of throbby quality to it. Um, doesn't really go right, go away right away, but uh, eventually does go away when you're when you're not active doing things. You're going to feel this pain a lot with running, squats, stairs, very similar to patella, patellofemoral pain. Um, but it's not going to be under the kneecap. It's going to be above or below. We often find this is uh, typical with runners who have very tight or overactive quads. Um, we, I think we talk about it a little later, but and certainly in other talks that I've done, um, the difference between a quad dominant and a glute dominant runner, where you're overusing your quads, which creates a lot of tension at the knee and a lot of um, excess motion kind of going up and down for the runner. Whereas using your glutes, you're getting a good push back behind you with the extension of the hip, which gives you a nice efficient move forward. And it's not overstressing uh, the structures at the front or the anterior knee. Okay, so here is uh, the runner's uh, worst nightmare. Well, probably not, but um, it, one of the more painful and uncomfortable things to have is this iliotibial band syndrome or IT band syndrome. If you are a recreational runner, um, you have been introduced to your IT band probably pretty early on um, as you've started to increase your distances and running more. Uh, saying, why does the side of my leg hurt? I don't understand. Why does it hurt all the way down at my knee? Um, so this is a connective uh, tissue, the IT band, that runs from the top of your pelvis on the outside, and it runs down like a triangle. You can see in that picture. And it tapers, 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 and attaches just past the knee. Now, the IT band is a dense fibrous connective tissue. It does not stretch. I'm gonna say it again, it does not stretch. Now, it does have a contractile portion to it, but the band itself does not stretch. So, if we are using, if we are misusing that IT band and that contractile portion called the tensor fasciolata, we can develop this overuse injury um, that runs down the lateral leg. So you're going to get that pain down the lateral leg. It can be above or below the joint line of the knee. Now, there's typically no pain at rest. Um, goes away. But as soon as you start running, it's going to start kind of niggling at you and kind of uh, bothering you. And uh, it just kind of gets a little bit worse. Um, the, f the more you run, the more it's going to uh, start flaring up on you. Now, this is typically due to a tightness of that of the structures around the IT band. And um, what we wanna do is make sure that that, that that tight structure is not adhering to everything around it, right? So it lies on top of your lateral quads and hamstrings, and it actually has some attachments to your hamstrings. So you wanna make sure that there has a little bit of glide uh, uh, over those structures, okay? Once it starts getting sticky and starts getting pulled around, that's when this pain can start kicking in. Okay, let's talk about hamstring strains a little bit. So this is where you're gonna get some pretty focal pain uh, in your hamstrings at the back of your thigh. Okay, you're gonna get, you can really get it anywhere from um, that attachment site up on, up on your butt bone there to um, all the way down behind your knee. Now, um, you can feel it in, in, in different places in different ways. Um, 
But with this, we're really gonna have some pain that you're gonna find. You, you are gonna have some pain at rest probably with this, okay? A strained muscle, um, it's gonna have some residual kind of, kind of throbbing dull pain to it, and, and especially even with just light activity. The hamstrings, you know, even as you walk, they have a purpose, right? Uh, when you walk and when you run, your hamstrings don't just help to contract and bend your knee, but they help to slow the extension of your knee as you're swinging your leg through, right? So you kind of think about it, your quads are trying to extend your knee, but your hamstrings are working in the opposite directions to make sure that your knee just doesn't fly out to its um, most extended um, too quickly, right? So they kind of work as a little bit of a, a tug of war. Right, and that's how you that's how you can get really get that pull in that hamstring is with that eccentric pull, that slowing down, that that controlled lengthening of the muscle. So we do have different ways that that kind of happens. Um, you know, we talk about this back seat running, where if you're kind of in a, an almost like a slouch seated position as you're running and you're pulling the ground a little too much, you can pull the hamstring that way. Uh, or if you're running and you have to slow up really quickly you can pull the hamstrings as well that way. Um, we see that a lot with, um, with uh, like baseball players, right? Uh, anyone, anyone that's played baseball and pulled a hamstring knows that you know, when you run, when you're just trying to steal second base, you don't pull your hamstring leading and, and launching off a of first. You do it slowing up as you go into second base. That's when that big pull, that slow down pull comes and you can get that pain. All right, we'll talk a little bit about the meniscus here. So um, <clears throat> with this, um, you're gonna feel this kind of deep pain, right? So it's not gonna feel like, I can't, I can't really put a finger on it, but I know that it feels like deep within, deep within the knee, right? So in the picture there, you have all different types of tears. I'm not gonna get into all that today, but it's a deep pain. It often comes along with the sensation of popping or clicking or locking or catching uh, and even a, a giving way sensation, right? So essentially, this structure that's within the knee joint um, has a tear or a little fold in it that's now impeding what's going on in the joint. So it's kind of like you're flicking a fingernail in there every time you move and you get this click, 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 click. Um, and that can be very ir irritating and painful. This is typically due to a traumatic twist at the knee in a, um, in a planted position, right? So think about kind of hitting the ground, coming this way, and then you get this twist at the knee, kind of uh, grinding in there. That can shear the joint and cause, um, cause that tear. Or due to running mechanics, if you hit the ground and you're twisting off every time, you can cause some uh, repetitive twisting at the joint, which can result in this meniscus um, injury. Okay, so the ligament injuries, these are, uh, so I say that they're most often from a traumatic type of injury. Um, that's not completely true. Uh, it's a traumatic incident, but not a traumatic, not necessarily a traumatic hit. Um, soccer players see this a lot. So you'll run, you'll plant your foot, and now you're going to plant, you're going to twist and try to go in a different direction. And that ACL just is not going to want to go with you. And it's just going to snap and give. Okay. They often call this kind of this point of no return where your, um, your, your hip is slightly adducted or kind of coming in, your knee is dropped in kind of knock kneed. Um, so now it's kind of on stretch and then you apply a little bit of twisting movement and it's just like you know I'm like opening a jar of pickles and uh, it just pops so um, for us as runners right um, you're gonna find these ligament injuries are more from a repetitive um, positioning of the knee right so we talked about how the knee should just be kind of going like this Right. Well, if the knee goes here and then has some gapping to one side or the other, you're going to put some repeated stretch on those ligaments, and that's going to result in uh, some of that ligamentous type pain. Okay. So when I take a look at a patient who comes in on a knee assessment, 
uh, for these more non-traumatic knee pathologies. It's usually a result of poor mechanics, these repetitive use. And the knee being such a simple joint, I need to look above and below and take a look at the hip and take a look at the ankle to make sure that those mobile joints are good and strong. Okay, with great mobility comes great responsibility. They need to be strong at those joints to help control and maintain the stability at the knee. So certain things I'm gonna look at, I wanna take a look at what a simple double leg squat looks like. But since we're running, I need to know what a single leg squat looks like, right? And running is a one-legged activity at all times. I need to see what that single leg squat looks like. We also do like a step down test. So um, using a six inch step, coming down uh, uh, forward off of the stair, leading with the heel, can the standing leg, not the reaching leg, maintain its position um, from the hip, the knee, the ankle during that whole motion. I want to see muscle length and muscle strength, right? So I want to see are the quads long enough? Are the hamstrings long enough? Are they really, really tight? Hamstrings can be a little tight for runners. That's okay because they need to have a little bit of that tensile quality um, to produce some of that spring of um, pushing your leg back, but not too tight. So we need to check that out. I want to see the calf length, the quad length, and the muscle balance. The quads and the hamstrings, um, just inherently the quads are stronger your, than your hamstrings, but we want those hamstrings to be at least 50 to 80% as strong as your quadriceps, okay? And then we already talked about being a quad dominant versus a hip dominant runner um, so that um, we're not wasting that energy going up and down by over firing our quads and our calves and going nice and straight forward as a hip dominant runner. Uh, enforcing that hip extension, driving back behind you. Um, one of my favorite views uh, is watching the New York City Marathon. Um, New York's my hometown. And I love the shot where they have um, the leaders and the motorcycle guy is next to him with the camera and looking at the runner from the side. And all you see is the background just flashing by, flashing by, flashing by. And the runner is just like this the entire time, just straight. Right. And then if you look at the pack, the pack is kind of doing this all, you know, all the runners like me are back there doing that. Right. But the lead runners are so efficient that they have no, no um, extraneous movement going up or down. It's 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 a beautiful thing to watch. OK. Oh, I shouldn't have put that in there. I meant to change that. That's my relationship with the foam roller. So sorry about that. Uh, so muscle length, we're talking about achieving greater length of muscle length for the quads, hamstrings, and IT band. Um, this is great to do a static stretch or a foam rolling after. Um, but beforehand, we want to do a nice dynamic stretch, get those muscles loosened up and um, neurologically ready for, for action. <clears throat> Here are some of my favorite static strengthening exercises. So like we talked about, I have to have a runner be very, very steady in a single leg to be an efficient runner, right? So a single leg march, uh, excuse me, a single leg bridge or a bridge with a march where you are focusing that bridge on one single leg, making sure the hips are nice and level going across to show that single leg stability. A squat with a band. That band helps to push out, engage your external rotators and your hip abductors um, so that you have good uh, glute strength to maintain a, a nice neutral pelvis as you're running. And, and therefore, your knee will be in a nice neutral position. A hip hike on a step where you're kind of letting your hips kind of drop and come back up, drop and come back up, all controlled by that stance side leg. And then I have that running man um, uh, exercise there <clears throat> where we're going in and out, all going up and down while on that one leg, just forward and back. If we look at more dynamic, more simple dynamic exercises, uh, lateral band walks are fantastic, easy to achieve at home. Putting a band around the ankles, walking side to side to get those lateral hip stabilizers, those glutes good and fired up. And then we have some uh, single leg hops from side to side, 
right? Putting it more dynamically. Can you hop and land onto one leg without the hip dropping, the knee dropping in, the ankle crushing in? Can you maintain that stability as you land onto each leg? You can progress those hops into different directions, <clears throat> uh, either going from one leg to another in different directions or one leg and just hopping on that same leg from side to side. Uh, very, very good challenge. Okay, so I got through everything that I wanted to get to on this. So uh, I do want to open it up for questions uh, at this time. If there are any questions here, I would love to entertain them. While you're thinking of those, let me uh, reiterate that um, this will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, and you can find out about more information and more um, events that we will be at on our Facebook page. So I highly encourage you to go ahead and sign up and uh, find out more information there. Um, my boys, thank you for tuning in today. Uh, and T. Hanks is there to say thanks and T. Hanks a lot. Um, so if anybody has any questions, uh, now would be a perfect time. You can just drop them in the chat there, and I'm happy to, uh, to answer. I know I kind of flew through a lot of this stuff today. Um, I tried to talk a little fast because I know it's lunch and uh, people have stuff to do. I gave this talk not too long ago, and uh, I think it took me about twice as long in person. So... <clears throat> Okay, so Joe's on here. Joe had a question wanting to know, so you're not a runner, but a long walker. Okay, so what, what are some of the injuries that are common for you? That's a fantastic question. So common, in, so some of these injuries are going to be extremely similar, if not completely similar. Okay, the only difference is that you now have a, um, a period of time where you have one foot or two feet. And you always go back and forth, right? The one foot, two foot, one foot, two foot, as opposed to running, which is one foot, no feet, one foot, no feet in the air, right? It's the closest thing we have to flying. But the injuries kind of remain, remain the same, these overuse injuries. Um, in particular, one that we didn't mention here today that I see a lot <clears throat> with long distance or uh, walkers is um, what's commonly known as shin splints or medial tibial stress syndrome. So that's that pain um, that kind of goes down the front of your shin, kind of just to the outside of your shin bone, um, often comes from an overactivity of a muscle, um, your, uh, your tibialis anterior that's there that works with flexing your ankle up. Um, now with that, you know, it's typically coming from a shorter, a shorter type of step where you kind of force yourself to kind of flex your foot up and you do a lot of uh, heel, heel to toe rolling, but you really pull those toes up a whole lot as you're walking. <clears throat> so um, what I make sure is that those patients, I want to make sure you have good ankle flexibility. Um, so that when you do pull those ankles up, you're not hitting a, an anchor on the other side. So making sure you have good calf length as you're doing that. And also making sure that your glutes are firing as you're walking as well. Um, it shouldn't just be kind of a, a shuffle there. You know, if you're going out for that long, the mechanics um, are important. Um, you know, there's also things to look at as far as, you know, potential you know, high ankle type sprains. But again, a lot of this comes from making sure that you have enough mobility uh, at, that, um, at that ankle to, um, to, uh, to achieve your, your desired uh, exercise. Thank you for the question. All right, any other questions for me? Going once, going twice. Ah, one more, okay. Heat versus ice and when? <clears throat> Another really good question. Um, 
So as every PT will tell you about every question, it depends. Um, here, here's what I like to say. So um, heat and ice. My general rule of thumb is that if something is feeling tight, locked up, kind of frozen in place, I want to use heat to try to calm it and loosen it up and kind of dissipate that stiffness. Okay. If something is feeling, um, something is feeling more kind of stretched and uh, angry, uh, more pain and, um, you know, just angry and heated up, then I want to use ice to try to cool it down um, and bring it back to a, a more controlled state. Now, research will show that um, it really doesn't matter which one you choose. What we're really trying to do is change the physiology of the tissue. So ice is a vasoconstrictor. Uh, so it, when you apply ice, it'll take all those vessels and kind of squish them up like this, make them contract, so that you're gonna squeeze out some of the, uh, the bad stuff that's in there. And then if, when you use heat, it's a vasodilator, which is gonna open up the vessels and help bring fresh oxygenated blood to the area. So I would, if you got something that's hurting you, you wanna try heat or ice, I would pick whichever one you, you typically like to use, use that first. If that doesn't help, Use the other one instead. If that doesn't help, try alternating. About 15 minutes for one, 15 minutes for the other. Alternate back and forth a few times and see if you can get some relief with that. You're basically trying to mimic the pumping of the blood through that area to kickstart a, a, um, a healing process. Thank you for the question. All right. All right, last call on questions. Okay. All right, well, thank you all so much for joining me today. I really, really appreciate you coming on out. If you do have any questions for me, uh, my contact information is right up there. I encourage you to go take it and send me an email. I'd be happy to help you out with stuff. If it's something I think you need to come in for, I'll let you know uh, if uh, PT is appropriate for you. Uh, but go ahead and uh, please do uh, check out our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. There's some great, great information on there and doesn't cost you a copay or anything. So, all right. Thank you all so much. Enjoy the rest of your day and um, we'll talk to you later. Thanks so much. Bye now.